Thank you, everybody, for coming. So this is GitLab for non-tech and project management use. Um, there's three of us that's going to be presenting today. Um, myself, I'm JJ Cords. I'm the marketing operations manager here at GitLab. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, Jackie Gregnola, she's a marketing program manager on the marketing team. And then Ty Davis, he's a technical marketing manager at GitLab as well. So, thank you. Um, so this is our rundown real quick. Um, we are going to, well, we just did our introductions. Um, we are going to be playing a game, and then we're going to be doing some basic concepts, a couple case studies, and then um, we will get to Q&A and possibly a live demo. Um, but to kick this off, I'm going to hand it over to Jackie so she can explain uh, the game. All right. So we're going to be very hands-on. Oop, not so. Okay. We're going to run a game. It's the gumdrop exercise. So some of you may have done this. It's a good opportunity to learn hands-on how project management is done. So we're going to break you into groups, and Ty's going to come around and just form five people per group. So you have to be close And to I'll describe the rules. So uh, in this game, we have one seer, you and you're the person who's going to be looking to at I'm the Oh, gumdrop, uh, yeah, I don't know what yeah. to call it, you like guys, structure, five, and you're able to describe yeah, to the runners um, what you're seeing. Five, they you can't ask questions, and the runners are going to be running back and forth, uh, getting the information and passing it off to the builders. The builders are the ones who are, or is the one person who is going to be building the structure, using the information received from the runners. And you'll have one observer as well in your group, and they're just going to be watching everything. Uh, Choose somebody who is comfortable with public speaking because you'll be giving a little bit of um, a rundown on your group at the end. So just a quick note, observer, feel comfortable with public speaking. So choose one seer, one builder, one observer, and the rest are runners. The seer is the person who will see the structure. They're allowed to describe to the runners what the structure looks like. The runners cannot ask questions. There's no back and forth, but you can use nonverbal cues. And the runners are going to be running back and forth, taking what they've heard from the seer and describing it to the builder. So and the builder is going to be trying to put together the exact replica of the structure of gumdrops and toothpicks. OK, you've got 15 minutes starting now. The runners can come over here, get the information from the seer, and run back to their group. Yeah, multiple runners can be over there talking to the seer at the same time. You can't ask questions of the seer. The seer can just say what they saw. Runners can't see the structure. <laughs> Runners, no talking. Observers, no talking. Seer, you can talk. I would recommend not eating the gumdrops as they have been handled by other people. <laughs> All right, will the observers please get your final product structure of your group and come up on stage. We'll go one by one and you'll have 30 seconds. You just kind of give us a, a rundown of what you saw, some questions you might want to go about. What was difficult about the process? Was it difficult to get some of that information back and forth? Um, and just general observations. We'll start on this end. Yeah, we'll start on this end. So, Caleb, do we come, have a Come down here a little bit, Caleb. Thing? No here, you can just speak into this. answer all three questions? Or? No. Yeah, no, you questions can just, or? just general Scoot observations. Scoot down, guys. Scoot down. <laughs> you come. Mark, go ahead. Well, hello, everybody. Go ahead. And then you um, the hope everyone's having an amazing day so far. Uh, first observation that I saw was first there's a lot of inefficiency. Uh, there's a lot of one person seeing something, right? And then there's a lot of downtime here where nothing's happening. And our, our poor builder here is just sitting waiting to receive instruction. And that's just wasted time. Uh, there's a lot of manual work that's coming back and forth. And then also from an observer's standpoint, it's hard for me to see what all is going on. Um, so, yeah, that was pretty interesting. But as you can see, we have this lovely uh, science project here. Not sure. You did an amazing job. <laughs> just, yeah. No, I just don't know it's the correct Brain job. But it's an sorry. amazing job. So, kudos. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Start on that. Yeah, that is quite complex compared to ours right here. Well, our team was awesome. So the seer, the seer was observing information that was passed on to the runners who also both deliberated and talked about interpreting that information, then hopefully remembering it by the time they got down to the builder, who the builder took on that information and tried to extrapolate whatever it was the runners were talking about and uh, trying to put together a structure. <laughs> 
Um, similarly, um, the inefficiencies, it was like you got a set of directions and all three people would run at once instead of maybe like one person staying behind. Um, but also similarly, instead of like breaking it down into pieces, I think sometimes you try to do the entire thing um, and try to get the full idea of it instead of saying, okay, let's take this first half, one person is in charge of that part, and then kind of break it down. Sorry. And here's a look at what yeah, it's they developed. <laughs> it's 2D, but good colors. All right, choice. So this is our first dot-com failure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the approach that our seer took was to break down into the component pieces, so numbers of dots, number of... Uh, toothpicks in each color. So um, that worked almost well, but right from the get-go it was wrong. So <laughs> it, um, it was, and I'm not sure if it was wrongly said or wrongly interpreted. Um, it was a bit like playing um, Chinese whispers or telephone. And then the problem was um, one person could use their eyes, one person could use their mouth, one person could use their ears. And so even though everybody had all the component pieces, they were only allowed to use one function at a time. And then there was no um, return communication allowed. So um, every time there was a possibility or question, it resulted in, in people doing the best that they could with what they had. And what was interesting was to watch the frustration building up as everybody knew something was wrong, but nobody could figure out how to communicate <laughs> where that was, so, so that was a problem, right? Thanks, Joyce. Mark? All right, uh, this is rather large, so I'm just gonna leave it back yeah. here. <laughs> I'll lift it up. It's like a fish. Yeah, it's, yeah, there, we constructed there a, a fish, yeah, there we go. And um, yeah, it's more or less the same of what everyone else has been saying. Just there's, there's this odd communication, and everything. The thing is, everyone had different communication styles, and so these there was no common language that everyone was speaking. Uh, I should point out, though, since I am from the security department, <laughs> that I noticed uh, I documented uh, three bugs in the game uh, mm. that I wanted to go ahead and report. Uh, Runners were able to eavesdrop on other descriptions, so, and I was surprised more people didn't try to take advantage of that, but that was possible. <laughs> also, runners were capable of giving false information, or, or there's capable of false information being able, so that runners are given the incorrect information if they tried to eavesdrop. And then, of course, there was the uh, liberal interpretation of the uh, rules and uh, the security department really frowns upon that behavior. <laughs> is it an, an so, issue? Is it an issue? No. Then it doesn't oh, yeah. exist. Oh, yeah. <laughs> is it in the handbook? Yeah, the eating of the parts <laughs> was bad. We, you know, <laughs> all kinds of departments are now involved, and you're all guilty. So, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, right. it was fun though. Thank you, and Karina. Um, so uh, I was actually quite impressed with the team. I think that they got fairly close. Um, the thing that I observed, I mean, obviously it was a difficult process um, and it was inefficient, but I felt like the seer um, was very detail oriented and tried to break it down into simple parts, but even that did not produce the results. Um, even more interesting is that um, the runners did come back and verify some things and still didn't quite get it. Um, so it's like no matter how detail oriented and how you try to break it down in small components, it still didn't come out with the result. Um, and it was, you know, not uh, going to be successful. So it was, uh, it was definitely an interesting process to watch. All right, so we got a dream catcher. <laughs> it was fun. Um, so uh, very similar to what a lot of folks uh, were saying. Uh, it started out so good. Uh, the smallest iteration possible was just eight toothpicks. Perfect, right? Uh, then the critical problem of it's two triangles and a square came out, and that just went all over the place. Um, the other fun thing is I watched uh, micromanagement get uh, reinvented, where the runners uh, were watching the builder, and they're like, no, 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 it goes here. Like, no, and they just started to do it for them. Uh, so I thought, I thought that was pretty funny. It's like, there's micromanagement right there. Um, yeah, fun. We got a fun little spike on the end. It's dangerous. Yeah, thank you. Dangerous. All right, so at this point, uh, before these two go, um, this is where I'm going to let you know a secret on the last two. 
that while you guys were all doing this, um, they were allowed, the runners were allowed to ask their seers questions. So as we actually look at their structures right now, you can see there's a lot different um, results and what the others have. So um, Jeff and Elizabeth, they're gonna talk about that. Jeff, if you can step forward too so that people can see what you produced. Yeah, so this is what we ended up with. Um, it works pretty well with the runners being able to ask questions of the seer. Um, I think echoing what everybody else said. I found the um, finding common language was really helpful. Evan was describing it as triangles and squares and Anthony translated that into, okay, open carrot, closed carrot, and, uh, or open bracket, Whatever. Um, uh, yeah, I think the only thing we missed is that there was a miscommunication where um, uh, Evan thought that that was everything, that he had communicated everything, and so the you know nobody really knew to to kind of check back in and say, okay, here's what we have, you know, here's what we've built. Let me describe it back to you. Um, but otherwise, I thought, yeah, communication made a huge difference. Um, so same observations um, at the beginning, you know, it was quite comical watching them trying to do this one. If they could ask questions, they did a lot better. Um, I thought that our seer did a great job of breaking it down into easy steps. Uh, and both the seers, once they were able to ask questions, they both had different questions, even though he was still giving them very small steps, like they still were really trying to clarify it. But then watch them come back to the builder, that's where even though I thought they both were on the same page, the seers, and they're trying to describe it to her, and somehow in like that, that small amount of space, they were both sometimes thinking this different things. Um, so it's interesting to see that even though you both seem like you might have the same idea in your head, like obviously once you're communicating it, you had a different picture in your head than what the other person had. Uh, so yes, definitely having better communication if the builder could have asked questions. I think we've gone a lot faster. I thought they did a fabulous job. We just missed a little triangle at the end, which our seer tried desperately to get out last minute, like five <laughs> seconds left, and they're uh, sprinting across. But, um, so I think they would have gotten it. Awesome. Thank you. So, um, you know, with this, uh, hold that, actually, I don't want to. Um, so with this game, obviously, it's just a fun game to play. Um, but driving down the point, you know, we are uh, a lot of what our tools use for is collaboration. Um, and so it's driving that bi-directional collaboration. Um, when we look at the people who can't talk to the person that has the goal in mind, um, obviously you could see some of the results end up not being what that person was asking for. And so when we have collaboration that's part of um, going back and forth and understanding what the better picture is, in the end you have better results that are very close to what um, you were looking to get. So the game is fun, um, but it's also to just show kind of a nice little example of what it's like to um, have collaboration uh, in different levels and um, get the result that uh, a team can do together instead of looking at that top down, let's just guess what he meant or she meant and go from there and then in the end, you, know, you, don't, you don't meet what was expected. So that's the game. We're gonna go into um, our presentation more now on GitLab. Thank you, But observers. thank you for playing. Hopefully it was fun. We can throw this away. And you guys just, can just uh, set your stuff down. <laughs> yeah. Or actually, actually dump it into the bag. You might have some clean yeah. ones. Into the bag. If you want dots, um, you get, we have some you can eat right here. We have some not <laughs> some <non> <laughs> dirty ones. Non-touched. Non-touched. <laughs> Sorry. All right, with that, I think I'm JJ's coming. gonna kick off with talking a little bit more specifically about how to use GitLab for non-technical and project management use. Thank you. JJ. So here's the basic GitLab concepts and project management. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is probably a really bold statement, but I feel that there's actually no such thing as a non-technical role in today's business environment because everybody has a role to play in software development. So like from the apps that you play on your phone to what you're doing within GitLab and actually what you do within an operating system, all of that information is getting fed back to the people who developed that. And that feedback loop is really important to make improvements in that. So in my mind, there's actually no such thing as non-tech. So. From a very basic perspective, software operates a lot like a layer cake. So you have to have a really strong foundation, and then that foundation builds upon other things. And each layer of frosting that's between each one of, like in this example, in this purple cake, um, the frosting between, those are like your webhooks or your APIs or actually the integrations that are then making those two pieces of software talk to each other. Um, and so each task that's above the next one can get more complex because it's building off the foundation that you've already put into place. So for GitLab, we can actually have everything from project planning to execution all done within one platform. 
And so if you take a look at the cake now, um, this is actually how GitLab's structured. So at the very top level, you can have a group. And then underneath that group, you can have epics. And then underneath that, you can have projects that have issues that then have templates. And so all of those pieces together can actually stand alone, or you can put them all together, and it makes a really awesome um, process in a workflow, and you can actually have lots of teams working together to get something massive done, but you've broken it down into little pieces. Um, and so this is actually how the marketing team has their system structured right now. Previously, we had everything into one big bucket, and it was just called general, and then we just would work from that. We've shifted to allow everybody to have their own project, so like the XDR marketing operations, field ops, corporate, digital marketing, and product marketing, those are all projects. The ones with the little file folders, those are actual groups because then underneath that they can put projects or they can put more groups. So they nested information. So there's more information built up underneath that. Um, and then epics are built at this level and you can think of an epic as like an umbrella. It just takes everything in all of these individual projects and rolls it up into one big thing. And so then we've also gone through and we've templatized a lot of tasks that were repeated. And so we know that anybody in any of the teams can then pick up this project and know what has been done, what hasn't been done, what needs to get done, and if there's a timeline associated to it, and then who's responsible for doing what. And so we've done a lot of that for uh, eliminating the manual tasks that um, happen on repeated projects. Like we've run campaigns and there's always a list upload or a field event and there's always a list upload. So this is one of those things or if like we're always running a digital ad, that's, there's certain things that have to happen, and so this is like the checklist, and so you don't want to do that every time and have variances, so you templatized that. And so then we also created a unified view to track our progress. So within marketing, we actually, our CMO has asked that we all use the exact same amount of labels, and so we have status, work in progress, review, and then scheduled. And so this view actually gives him the ability to see what everybody within the company is working on from that very high level, um, and where it is within project completion. Um, and so this is an issue board, and everybody within the company, use, or within marketing, I should say, uses these labels. And so Todd always has an ability to see what we're working on. Um, and then this is how marketing is chosen to observe epics and parent epics. So you can have the relationship between an epic and a child epic, and it's a one-to-one. -one. Um, you can have multiple children to a parent, and you can get further down, but marketing has only chosen to do two different levels, so it's a parent and a child, and then you have issues underneath it. Um, but you can only have one issue associated to one epic. You can't have issues associated to multiple epics. Yes? Um, Jackie's actually going to do that in just one second, and then if you still have questions, we'll cover them at the end. Yes, ma'am? Yes, okay, so within GitLab, thank you, um, there is a change in terminology. So parent epics was what they used to be called. They're actually now called ancestor epics. I don't know the reason behind that, but that is what it is. Um, and so just from a project management standpoint, you want to define what your ideal state is, and then you want to create that framework. So you have to have a really strong foundation before you can work from anything. Um, for each piece of the project, you want to make sure that you have a DRI, which is a DRI, it's a direct responsible individual. Um, they're the person who's responsible, like um, our director of uh, field ops, he likes to call it one neck to choke. So it's the one person responsible for that thing, and that's the person you can follow up with. Um, and then, like I said, you templatize the re repetitive tasks, and then you set SLAs. So based on like the due date, you work backwards and figure out how much each piece should be taking. And then create rules of engagement and definitely have like a feedback loop. So like in our example and in this game, the people who could ask the questions and ask for clarification, they got closer to this structure than the people who could only go one way. So you want to make sure that you have that feedback loop. Um, and you can iterate the process as you go. So if something's not working, change it. Um, so like I said, Jackie's actually going to now jump into, oh wait, sorry, ha <laughs> ha, documentation. Um, it's always very important to document what you're doing. Um, in our marketing handbook section, you actually can see the entire structure that we've done, issues, milestones, templates, groups, projects, all of it, um, and what all the different labels mean. And so anybody new to the company can actually jump in and read this area and get a really good idea of what it is we're doing and how to interact with the issues and projects in our section. So now I'm handing it over to Jackie and she's gonna talk about the integrated campaign.
Thank you, JJ. You're welcome. All right, so I'll just share kind of an example of how the marketing team has been using epics and issues. And a good example is the Just Commit campaign that we began in January of this year. So it was our first integrated campaign. And if you're not familiar with what that means, it's basically landing a single message across all channels. So using social media, digital marketing, our, all of our content, our website. And in doing so, it was involving a lot of different team members. So we had field marketing, content marketing, digital marketing, marketing operations, business development, and SDR organization. There are a lot of people involved. And initially, when we were kicking off, I had a Google Doc and I had, OK, here are all the different things I can think of that we need to do. And then realized, we could do this in GitLab. So doing so was our first kind of test into using epics to give um, kind of the high level information and then organize the group into a single unified vision for what this campaign would become. So this is our, well, ancestor now campaign, which is basically giving you a full level look at the campaign personas, messaging, quick links to the recordings of any meetings that were taking place so that if somebody maybe was missing something, they could go back and rewatch if they needed to. And the goals of the campaign, the messaging. So here's another look. This is just two screenshots of that parent epic where we also included key timelines. So what needed to be done by what dates to hit a very, very tight timeline and deliver delivery date of February 18th. So you can also see we, I, we documented who the team members that would be involved. So what different team was responsible for what different part. And from there, we got more specific. So the parent or the child epics, we included things like the events and webcasts and emails, what, were, what was the sales enablement that needed to take place, what was the content that we needed for each key pillar, and positioning and messaging was the first thing that we took, in, took into consideration. We also used labels that said just commit, and that just gave you the flexibility to use the issue list to say anything with the label just commit, let's see where we stand, what's still open, what needs to be done. And in this example, this was the strategy and design epic. And in this, we had lots of different tasks. So you can think of the issues as the task that needs to get done. Each issue has a directly responsible individual, like JJ mentioned, and it had a due date. And these due dates were really important because there were a lot of dependencies that were happening. We couldn't work on the content until we knew what the message was. We couldn't work on anything related to digital marketing until we had the designs approved. So. This just kept us organized and saying, what do we need to get done by what dates and keep us on the timeline that would help us hit that delivery date. Here's another example. It's the positioning and messaging epic. And this was the first thing that we were jumping into. And again, this was like a lot of the things that were dependencies for other groups to be able to complete their work. And with that, I'll turn it over to Ty. And at the end, we'll have questions. So if you have things related to that, Thank you. We're good on time, we'll be able to so. jump on it. All right, now it's my turn to talk about um, how product man or marketing um, uses GitLab to do project management. So um, I'm in technical marketing. Um, I know some product marketing people out here. Um, the way that JJ described is you have marketing and then you have uh, marketing is that group. And then there's several projects that are labeled either like marketing ops. Um, there's product marketing and then I always forget the rest of them. Which, Obviously, I'm focused on product marketing, so I click on that one all the time. Um, but you have that project and group structure. Now, there is uh, examples, like, if, and I'll talk a little bit connecting this on the technical side, but you can create subgroups and all that stuff. But the way we do it is that um, parent group or ancestor group and then the projects that are within that. I'm going to be more specific on talking about just how we use the board views. Uh, you have the group project structure. You have epics that reside within groups, and then you have um, issues that are created at the project level. Um, issues can roll up to the group. So if we have these different marketing groups um, that are specific projects, we can go to the marketing group, and all issues from all those different projects will roll up. And then you can see uh, in a board view there everything that's going on from all the different um, marketing groups. Now you can also have board views in um, just the project. This is what we have in product marketing right now. After this last session, I learned something, um, and that's probably that we should have our board views at the marketing group level. That way, when we're assigned something by marketing ops or by um, content, that um, we can still have that visibility 
uh, into that issue as well instead of having to replicate um, our own just to track our stuff. So right here, it's just um, the moving it from the, the lane to lane, uh, the, I forget what it's, um, the status is status plan, status work in progress, and then I think there's one more status one. Review um, and schedule. Review, which w we don't use on our board, but um, those are the mandated that was decided upon with the Todd uh, that that's what our marketing should use is if you have a review work in progress, this gives him visibility at that parent group level. If he wanted to look at the board and see everything that's in process, he could see all the issues that are correlated with that, that label. Uh, we labeled and everyone has, what's the proper word you used earlier for labels that you want to create? They're additive labels. Additive labels. Uh, we have tech PMM because I want everything that's tech PMM specific to come up on my board. So I'm filtering on my board by tech PMM, and that's showing everything that's uh, specific to our technical marketing team. Uh, we use the, we, we could create boards based on assignee. So this allows us to see uh, who has um, what issue, what they're working on. Uh, maybe your manager just wants to see what the team's working on or you're uh, being a collaborative agile team and want to just see what everyone's doing or what you can work on together. Um, you could see the specific issue that that person's working on. And you can organize that uh, by assignee inside of the board views. Um, something that's not often used right now, uh, and this is something that's even for our customers trying to get them to use more often, is the burn down charts. Uh, we categorized it by we as in product marketing, so this maybe should be more aligned, but as Q1 FI20 and added that milestone to our issues to take a step back and say, what is a milestone? Uh, milestones is somewhere where you can define a time increment. Um, so you can have a start and an end date. For us, that was Q1. So in this particular case, it was four months. Uh, and so in that milestone that we defined, it was January 1 to um, what month are we in? April 30th. And all the issues that were done in that time are reflected on that burn down chart. Uh, and you can see ours in the typical burn down chart because during the course of that um, four months, you're going to add more issues to it. And then you're going to work on those. And then eventually you reach that point where you're complete. And then you move on to um, Q2, FY20. Where are we on time? OK, we got time. Um, so related as a customer, so my job is technical marketing, so um, I've worked a lot with agile planning tools. Um, the way on the, the engineer side, the more of uh, the dev side that GitLab is used for, you could look at um, issues and project management as, uh, even for us too, but you're going to have uh, those merge requests that are uh, connected to um, the issues that are doing something with the repository. You could do that for us as well if you're changing something in the handbook. Uh, you create a merge request and you tie that to an issue. Uh, but for a customer, um, if they have their application, they're working on that, um, they create an issue, an issue is a problem, an enhancement, uh, maybe an addition to something. Um, that's the starting point where you're going to move that in, in the, the lanes that you saw to you know, work in progress or complete. And then you have that merge request, uh, which is tied to the issue. So I create an issue. I'm a developer. I see, OK, I need to work on this. Uh, I'm going to create that merge request, and then check out a branch from the master branch, get working on that, and then uh, have the ability to collaborate inside that merge request or inside that issue. Once we've defined our, um, it, once it's done and you know it's passed, then uh, closing that merge request will close an issue. And then there's a lot more to the process in terms of what we do with auto DevOps and stuff. But for a customer that's doing uh, more engineering or even our own uh, GitLab uh, engineers, you are doing um, you have that issue as a starting point, and a merge request is that fix or that addition to make sure that, that issue is completed. Um, aside from that, going back from customers just to us, I think uh, we just need to move our board to <laughs> your board. So I need to move it up to the, the group level so that um, <coughs> I can just roll up all issues that are connected to us in there. So we have actually more time this time for you to yeah. go through. Um, Thank you. So just to kind of explain what we mean by the different levels of GitLab, I'm actually going to jump just right into our GitLab instance. Um, so within GitLab, like I said, with the layer cake example, there's lots of, there's lots of layers. So GitLab.com, that's the highest level of all of GitLab. And underneath that, you'll have a lot of different groups. 
And so you'll see things like the marketing group, biz ops, biz ops group, there's sales, et cetera. And each one of those can then have their own projects underneath it. You can build an epic and issue board at this level, but then you can also jump down into just this marketing specific level and build issue boards and epics at that level as well. Um, the difference between the two levels is if you build the issue board at this top level, it will roll up everything from every other project underneath it. If you build it down at the marketing level, it'll only pull things from within marketing. And so you have to think about where your work lies and where you should be building your issue boards and epics. So as an example, marketing ops, we presently work across departments. So we do a lot with sales ops, biz ops, sales in general, and all of those are individual projects and groups. And so our issue board is actually built at this highest level because we need to pull in everything else. So if we go over here to the left and we click on boards, you'll see, let me get to the right board. So this is our marketing operations board. And if you look closely at all the issues that are underneath this, you'll see which project they actually belong to. So the little URL slugs tell you where it actually lives. And so some of these are on the employment one, which is a people ops board. Others are within our own project or Salesforce. And because we have additive labels, um, we see it in these different columns. So marketing ops has many additive labels because we have to track things across different projects that are outside of marketing. But you'll also see the marketing ones in here too. So the status work in progress or review or things like that. And so on this board, we have our labels, but then we also have what Ty showed was by people. So these are uh, the people that are on marketing ops. So there's Robert, Nicole, and myself. And these are the issues that we're assigned specifically to own. And then if we keep scrolling to the right, you can see all our other columns that have different labels associated to them. But because our board is built at this highest level, we have everything. If we took this same board and built it down at the marketing level, we would lose everything that's in the employment project, the sales project, Salesforce, et cetera. So we're not getting that global view. So as you're building this for your own teams, like think about are you working cross team or are you only working with your own team? So like Jackie, she built one of her own issue boards down at the um, digital marketing programs level. So just within that one itty bitty project. And she had issues in like field marketing that weren't showing up on her board. And so then she had to move everything to the higher level, to the marketing level, because then she could have both digital marketing and field marketing show up on that board. So like as you think about it, like it's, it is like a cascading waterfall. Um, so this is the marketing group. So everything in each one of these projects can show up on a board. And labels are about the, about the same. A label can only be applied to a project or a group. If you put a label, a project label on an issue and you then want to do something at a group level, that issue label may not show up. So like, you have to think about it, that as well. So like labels, if you build them on the project level, you can only use them on issues within that project. So again, like if field marketing had a label on it that's like field marketing and Jackie created something in digital marketing programs and wanted to put that field marketing label on the digital marketing issue, she couldn't because that label was created only for that one project. But if, she, if the label was at the marketing level, then she could use it in both projects. So you also have to think about that. Um, and so same thing for like marketing ops, we have all of our labels built at the very highest level in the highest group possible because then we can use it across all the groups within GitLab. Um, and so that's kind of the layering structure. It gets a little deep and complex. So if that got too deep, please let me know. Um, that is about all we have to present today, but we are gonna be taking questions. So there are two mics here in the room. So if you have questions, if you could please go to one and we, one of us will gladly answer for you. Okay, so if you have a issue in a CS project, you still cannot add that to, um, to a marketing project, like you can't add your label, or you can, you just can't? If your label is at the gitlab.com level, yeah. then yes, you could. But if you built your issue board in field marketing, you wouldn't then be seeing the CS thing. Your issue board would have to be up to roll everything underneath it. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Does so that you make could, sense? Yeah. Okay. You could build, um, so you could, I'm trying to take your, so if you have labels at the group level and you have those issues already in a specific board, you could still create a board at the group level and just use that um, label that you've created to make it at the group level. 
We'll talk about it later. Basically, like a lesson learned for me. I created all my labels at the marketing, digital marketing programs, like group, because that's the group I'm in. And then I had issues that were coming from like field marketing, content marketing, and I had to redo everything. So basically think about where you're like, where you would want to apply the label. And if it's going to be at other groups then make it at a level higher, you just had to redo labels though, right? Not, not issues. Yeah. But I, yeah, yeah I it was just labels like that you had to redo. A hundred. Yeah. Well, and boards, but yes, labels and boards <laughs> were the only thing that had to be redone. Boards is easy. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. What's the distinction between the dry and the assigned in terms of how you think about that? Um, in reality, they should be the same. Um, the way that, well, every team does it differently. The way we do it is that whoever's <laughs> presently responsible for getting that work done is who's the assignee. Um, and the dry should match, but like with a list upload, I'm presently assigned for most of them, but if I'm no longer going to be doing it, I will change the assignee to somebody else. Um, and so they, sh they should really match, but they don't necessarily, because if there's multiple steps within it, you change the assignee to whoever is like on deck right now. And then once they're done with their piece, they change it to whoever is now on deck. But there should be one person who's in charge of making sure all of that gets done. An example from Just Commit, because it was like I was learning who was in charge of what. Um, I wouldn't set the assignee or the due date until I had negotiated with the person, like, will you be able to get this done by this date? We need it for this other dependency. Um, and once they agreed that they were the correct person to be doing it and that they could do it by the date, that's when we would assign that, just as an example. Okay. And then when you're doing MRs, how do you know who to assign the MR to? The way marketing does it is you generally assign it to your direct manager um, okay. or the operations person within your team. Okay. Yeah, so if you are assigning an MR to somebody that doesn't have merge rights, you'll see a little red triangle next to their name um, on the MR, and that just indicates that they don't actually have merge rights and can't handle that for you. But if it's something that you're needing them to look at before it gets merged, I would still assign it to them, and then they can reassign it to somebody who has rights to merge it. who has rights to merge things, <laughs> myself, um, business ops, and a few people in people ops do, and any of the infrastructure team does as well. I just like a little tidbit if you don't know it. I mean, you can also, if you get a comment to you and you get that in an email, you can reply in your email and it'll show up in the issue. Um, yep, that's and then really there's helpful. integrations with Slack and Mattermost. So if you wanted to get notifications, anyone to build out or just, yeah, it's not that hard to add those integrations, but still you can get notifications via Slack on comments. Yes, Francis. Hey, uh, just curious, how are you guys using uh, weights for issues? I just kind of pick random numbers, but... At like, the moment, oh. uh, most of marketing is not using weights. Uh, the product marketing team or the technical marketing team might be. I know the data team is using it, um, and they're using it kind of like the Pythagorean, where it gets bigger. Um, so it starts with one, two, then it goes to five, then 13. Like, the it goes all the way up to 13, one to 13. So yeah. with weights, it's um, not just with us, but even with uh, customers who are approaching Agile, it's always... Um, not the, it, it has to be a complete buy-in by everybody. Everyone has to decide on the scale that they're using, like the Fibonacci scale, and they have to, you know, be able to weight the issues in, in that manner because, like, I tried to do it in product marketing, but I, obviously we haven't, I did it for my personal self. It's not like I talked to the rest of the team. It's like, hey, this is what we've decided. Um, weights, there's not a GitLab standard right now there's for not. weight. Right. Exactly. So Yeah, there's there's some uh, team capacity stuff that hopefully eventually we add to GitLab that can you can like predict out um, per like sprints 
and everything. So the, the weight is more like if people are doing that true agile and sticking to it like you're saying, um, that's a big association with that. You gotta stick to it. Yes, Jim. With respect to your status labels, the additive status labels, yes. uh, have you all collaborated with other groups? Because it seems like your status work in process is what other groups are called doing. And it feels like you know, we would want to have some sort of commonality so that we could grab labels in a consistent way. Are you guys talking with any other groups? Um, at the moment, we're not. So marketing as a whole has have chosen to the labels that we've chosen. Um, but we do each respectively. Like each of our teams have other additive labels. So like marketing ops has some, marketing programs has others. Field marketing has additional ones for like East Public Sector West. Um, so no, we haven't collaborated with other teams across GitLab. Um, it is something that like I'm working on a project with Francis on for sales ops as well. And so we are trying to get some of that standardization, but until the whole company agrees, right. um, it's not something that we'll be able to standardize. Yes, ma'am. Okay, quick question. So is there a way to um, create an MR in a group, which when it's merged, close an issue <coughs> in a different group? So, so yes. The question is, can you create a MR in a group that doesn't, that will close an issue in another group, yeah. right? Um, yes, you can. Um, so in every MR, if you do a slash command and it's slash, um, you do slash close and then you just put the link of whatever issue it is that you're wanting to close, it'll close it wherever it happens to be. Uh, okay. You could also put the issue number two. Yep. Cool. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. You can go. Hold on. So thank you, because you just changed my life that you can do issues and boards at the gitlab.com level. That's awesome. Um, I was quickly trying to find the answer to this, but do you know if it'll go into private groups and repositories, like Legal Tracker, the compliance team has some stuff that isn't visible to other parts of the organization? I'm wondering if you can still aggregate some of that information up. You can't. If it's a private thing, then it won't be showing up. Cool. Thanks. Hi. Hi. Um, so you were showing it first, right, at the group level. Where I'm part of the public sector team, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have the marketing team underneath it. So things that are happening at the marketing level that have been, you know, end up, I guess, breaking down into the specific issues, they have their own labels. But on the channel side, which mine is under public sector, I'd love to be able to uh, tie my label in there for, like, partner marketing into what it is that's over at the marketing group level. Is there a way to do that or no, because it's, it's two different groups and... Um, it is possible. So if the label is built at a level higher than both of the groups, then you'd be able to put that label on either group and have it show up. Okay. Does that answer your question? It, yeah, it does. So what would be higher than that? If I'm looking at um, like, you know, the, the first place that you start off with um, what I thought was groups, right? Which is at the highest level. So this level? Uh, yes. Yes, if you put your label at this level, then it'll work in your channel, and then it'll also work in marketing. Um, but then your issue board would have to be built at this level also to be able to pull in both of those issues from the two respective places. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> if you need help, please it's reach fine. out. We're more than happy to. Um, are there any other questions? Okay, um, there is a survey in your app. If you wouldn't mind giving us feedback, that would be awesome. Otherwise, thank you for coming. And if you have any questions, please reach out to any of us on Slack. We're more than happy to help go through these. Um, we will also get you slide copies if you'd like that. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.